I think it fueled it, Frederick, fuel, and that turned into a, a pretty long process. Uh, talk about county administrator. <laughs> First of all, we talked about what he knew that was short, then we talked. It is 9.02, we will call the March 17th meeting of the Environmental Services to order uh, with the approval of the agenda. Make a motion, we approve the agenda. Second. <clears throat> motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda. All in favor? Okay. Aye. Opposed the same. Uh, approval of the March 3rd minutes. Second it. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor of the uh, <clears throat> March third minutes? Say aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Carried. Uh, any public comment? Mr. Any Chair, public we have no public comments in the West Conference room, but we do have the applicant for the public hearing up here for later. Okay. Thank you. There. Uh, I, my name is Dave Rasmussen. I have a comment regarding item 8E. I don't know if you want me to 
comment on that now or you can comment on it now. Uh, again, my name is Dave Rasmussen, MSA Professional Services for consulting firm. Uh, I am also the village president of Bluff. Um, one of the things that I, I hope that uh, I, I attended the uh, County Trails Advisory Group meeting on Monday night. Uh, I uh, had to leave early for another meeting and uh, now, as a consultant, you see a lot of RFPs, and I just hope that this RFP is, is fairly concise. Um, one of the things that I would hope that you would consider is maybe having, once the RFP goes out, that you look at having a um, pre-proposal meeting so that consultants could come and ask the questions. Because as, as hard as you try to make this a concise document that consultants can respond to, there's still a lot of questions. And so uh, maybe pre proposal meeting at some time prior to the submission would answer a lot of those questions. Oh, Thomas. Okay. Thank you. Nobody online or anything, Bob? Okay. Let's start. Uh, disclosure committee members, somebody can raise their hand or <clears throat> they have that. Uh, any supervisors, Bob, online? All right. Um, what? Is there anything on here that's going to take eight, 10 minutes? I suppose we can get Ben to talk about 9E. Nine, which one? 8A. 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 Okay. Just text it on his, he's on his way. No problem. Perfect. Morning, everybody. Uh, what I would like to do is present on the different types of ATV trails and classifications. <laughs> Excuse me. Do I need a microphone? Um, so, my, my goal here is that that everybody can walk away understanding some some real simple terminology that has to do with trails the difference between state trail county trail funded trail that kind of stuff Thank you. so the first the first set of terms i'd like to talk about have to do with the state trails and difference between state trail and state funded trail. You guys all have a, a printout of this PowerPoint here. So a state trail is something that is owned by the state. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, similar to uh, like the Gandhi, for example, is a state trail. With that comes the requirement to follow NR44. We need an MOU with the state. We also have to have a master plan. Uh, 
state funded trail is something that we receive grant money from the state to develop and maintain, but it's not necessarily owned by the state. So state funded trails, the Gandhi is a state funded trail, but the state owned trail. So we can have a state funded trail. There's no master plan required, although it's probably a good idea. There's no MOU required state funded trail like there is a state owned I guess I'd like to maybe take questions as we go. If anything comes up, that's okay, Mr. Chair. We all good with state, there's state funded and state trail. Okay. So there's a few terms here that have to do with county type trails. First being county trail. County trail would be an unfunded trail. That is something that County is is 100% responsible for development, maintenance, long-term costs associated with that trail. You can have mixed ownership, uh, private, county, municipality trails, um, but this really has to do with the funding mechanism for that trail. All the money comes out of the county. Uh, forest roads within the county forest. All of the trails. Roads in the forest, they're reversible with the vehicle. We're considering that a forest road. And these can be these can be a mix of gas tax roads and non-gas tax roads. So for the for this conversation, all of the roads in the forest, whether we're getting money, gas tax or not, forest roads. And the next the next term there is designated trail. What that means, that's a county level term, county forester mark, designate an ATV trail within the county forest, whether that's on a forest road, whether it's on a gas tax road, or a, if it's in the county forest and it's you know, open to ATVs, that would be designated. There's no funding, you know, there's no funding tied to that term. It's just simply an internal county level term. To uh, show what's open and what's not in the forest. So we talked about state. We talked about a couple of terms in the county here, and then there are some combined options. Uh, a route is anything like a highway or a sidewalk, a city street that is open to ATVs. There really isn't any funding for that other than sign install. There's no maintenance, no development, cost share. Um, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about that. Hybrid trail. Hybrid trail is it's a combination of road, like a gas tax road, forest road, and an ATV trail, where there is some cost share dollars associated with that. So um, we're going to get a little bit more into that. And then a network is simply a combination of any of these of these trail types or designations that'll make up a bigger a loop or a you know complex of trails. So this is this is where it gets a little bit a little bit more in depth. Um, what I wanted to do here was to demonstrate the level of county dollars associated with these types of trails. So the trail that requires the least amount of county dollars is the state funded trail where 100% of development and maintenance costs are handled, you know, covered by the state through motorized grants. One of the main catches, I'm not going to say drawback, but one of the things to consider with this type of trail is it's only open to ATVs and UTVs. This is not something where we could have, you know, highway legal vehicles, dirt bikes, Horses, um, it's only ATV UTV. Do we have any of those? Currently, no. Well, the, the Sterling Loop is is a ATV only trail. So yes, we do. Yep. So so how much do we get for like the cattail that's that's open to four wheelers, but it's open to realistically everybody else too? Um, I mean, do we get the do we get the six hundred mile? Summer use. 
Um, we 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 do. Yep, we do. Um, the way the way that works, and I guess I misspoke. Um, the ATV trail won't get any other funding for a summertime use. So um, you, you can't ride a vehicle on it. You can't take your pickup down it, but you could take a horse down it or a bicycle or something. So the state funded trail rates there, summer use, 600 a mile. The additional use of UTVs is another $200 a mile. If you want a exclusive winter use ATV trail or a shared ATV trail with snowmobiles, that's another $200 a mile in maintenance contributed to that trail. So you could get up to $1,000 a mile for a state funded ATV trail. Then as we're sliding down, um, Kind of the cost share scale here with more county dollars. We have the two types of hybrid trails, gas tax road, and then the non-gas tax road. Basically, what that is, um, with the hybrid trail, you're allowing vehicles on the on the trail or on the road. So you're only going to get a maximum of 50% of those state rates. That's 600, 200, 200. 50% of those non-gas tax and if it's gas tax you you minus what you get for gas tax and then you get your you know maximum 50 percent so there are some funding mechanisms for roads that are already open to vehicles that one that one gets a little bit that one gets a little bit murky but that that makes sense you have an example of that one in the county uh, no, I don't think so. No. Say, for example, we have a, a forest, forest, county forest that we're getting some gas tax money on. You know, and that rate changes every year. But the most we could get is, is half of the state rate. So once you minus your gas tax, it's, it really works out to be about the same, about 300 miles. Roughly. So, and then all the way on the other end with the most county dollars is, is the county trail. So that's where all development maintenance costs are assumed by the county. Are there any, any other questions on this before I go on? Most of our trails then fall into that category. County trail? No, we don't really have any county, uh, any county ATV trails. We have the the rail trails, which are state funded. Yeah. Like the sawmill would be a good example. That's a county owned trail, but it's state funded. Okay, gotcha. So the the five miles in Sterling is that is that that's just a county trail? Or is state funded okay yep. state funded county owned trail that would be an example of a state funded designated ATV trail. Okay. um the key takeaways are going to be short they're going to be short okay i'll go quick so the key takeaways, state funded trails are not the same as state owned trails. Uh, state owned trails requiring MOUs, master plans. Um, there are no vehicles allowed on state funded trails, like the Gandy Dancer and the Cattail, you can't drive your pickup there. Routes and hybrid trails, it's a blend of different funding levels and different uses. That's the most flexible option. New trail networks, they're a, a mix of all these different types of designations and trail classifications. And the county can designate an ATV trail on anything uh, in the county forest. So that's that's it for my presentation. Um, what I would uh, what I would like to do, we've we've talked about the Sterling Loop and the development that's that's kind of ongoing up there. Uh, I would like to be able to take that to PTAG and have them 
vet some options and develop some concepts, bring that back to committee for a, a formal recommendation. Where's the four wheeler group that's sitting out there in all of this? I mean, they're involved in it too. They are. Doug, John, Doug Johnson is upstairs, yeah. I guess, and he is. But, but yeah, no, just so we're not taking, I guess what I'm saying is that so that we're not taking away from the, the ATV group, they will be involved in all of this too, that, that Doug kind of chairs and oversees. Doug, Doug would be a real important part of that communication. He's on both PTAG and the ATV. Yeah, I, I, I guess I meant both Doug's at the same time, Supervisor Rowdy, oh. too. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, just so that group is also involved in it, in the, in the Sterling Loop. Um, so, yeah, Doug, do you have any comments on that? And cutting out, so I, I, you have to back up on the groups, please. Okay, well, <clears throat> well, go ahead, Ben. Why don't you just start over and, and kind of say what you said about taking it to PTAG, and then we'll just kind of try and start from there again. I have to start, stand under a mic. Yeah, I'll stand a little closer to a microphone there. Um, Supervisor Rowdy, what I asked for was um, the Sterling ATV UTV trail project that has been talked about I would like to bring that, um, have, have environmental services recommend that I take that to PTAG. We can, we can vet some of this stuff, uh, develop a few concepts, and then bring that back. Um, but, but letting PTAG handle the, you know, kind of the, the nitty gritty stuff about where and how to, to develop these trails. So recommendation to PTAG and then PTAG to come back to environmental services with the concept. And then, you know, including including the ATV UT group, UTV group um, through the the communication that Doug Johnson would provide, being in both both groups. Did you get that, Doug? Uh, yes, I I did. I am totally following, except the part about we were created under the assumption that we were going to work on ATV, UTV, tourism act activities in Polk County. And it just seems like I, it's just a premature because I have to kind of get my concepts together. But I think we should be working on, which we did start working on the new uh, ATV, UTV, Sterling Loop, a bigger one. So I guess it's something we're going to have to discuss and, and figure out where this goes because we have the ATV UTV groups in our in our meeting and that's the ones that would be ultimate ultimately responsible for it because then it would become a state funded trail. Is that correct, uh, Ben? It, it certainly it certainly could be a state funded trail uh, and that was that was what I was trying to get across that we can have a, a composition of a, a few different types of trails so state funded is certainly an option well that's an option I guess that's what I say I, we have to get our thoughts together are we willing Sorry. to come later in the in the meeting and, and get our so Okay, let's let's come back to this. We'll uh, we'll set this aside, table it, right? All right, we're going to table it until later in the meeting, uh, <laughs> so that we can that we can get to our nine fifteen public hearings before it gets too late, because this could lead to a little lengthier discussion. I have a feeling. Um, so, but yeah, all right. Thank you, Ben. Um, we'll be back again after the the public hearing here, which I don't think will be overly long. Sorry, Jason, the, uh, yeah. Maybe Jason, again, slide that up a little bit just so you're closer to a microphone and. 
Doug and Kim, if you uh, if you can't hear Jason, raise your hand or flag at us or something so that we we know. Mr. Chairman, could I just make a comment and Kim can raise his hand. When I say I couldn't hear, it went completely dead for a few seconds. So, okay. And then it came back on. So it wasn't that we couldn't hear, which is nice that Jason moved up. I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to say that it we lost the sound. Okay. All right. Do you want to open the public hearing? Uh, just a second. Hey, Bob, is there any way that we can make uh, him and Doug bigger? Oh. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Let's open the, we will open the public hearing at uh, 925. Yep. This request for a zoning district change was submitted by Lewis May the property is currently zoned farmland preservation 83 and he's seeking to rezone to residential ag five and the property in question is located at 2435 35th street it's the northeast quarter of the southwest quarter of section 33 town 36 north range 15 west in the town of mckinley the parcel number is 038 Zero zero seven seven six zero 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 zero. Property is forty point five two acres in size. The farmland preservation A three district used to be called the exclusive A district before the county went through the comprehensive rewrite in two thousand sixteen. The town of McKinley had the most farmland preservation zoning out of any town within the county at roughly about 42 to 43 percent. A lot of the properties back then uh, got out of farmland preservation zoning because there was no benefit for them to be within the program because in order to qualify for like the tax credits in that, which is the, the main benefit for farmland preservation, 80 percent of all the land within that town has to be zoned farmland preservation. So with 40 percent, we were way short. You know, and that and the main property here is one of the properties that was originally zoned that exclusive ag, so it remained farmland preservation. But now he would like to take and build a non farm dwelling on the property, which is prohibited under farmland preservation. So, by rezoning the property and that to residential ag five, residential ag five, he'll be able to build a normal non farm dwelling on the property. The property, as I said, is uh, 40 or a full quarter quarter. Um, it does have some shoreland zoning on the south side of the property. There's a real small dry run or, or a yearly uh, creek that, that runs through the property. There's a little bit of wetland around that property or around that creek as well on the south end. Um, there's no floodplain though. There's really no um, navigable waters. It is just a dry run creek. Um, there is a building on the property right now, and it's a 60 by 108 full shed that was permitted in 2006. Uh, the Mays purchased the property in 2002 from Ed Dipprenner, which is a farmer up in that area. And I'd say that roughly in that is probably 60% open, 40% woods, or around 50 50 in that open versus wooded land. We provided the notice in that to the town um, and, that, and the DNR and DATCAP and received no feedback or no exhibits on it. Um, at the time and that, that we were going through the comprehensive rewrite, we did receive um, you know, meeting minutes in that from the town of McKinley that said that they had no problem with people rezoning out of farmland preservation to RA5 going through the future. Uh, so that approval has been obtained. And that's all I've got. And the, the applicant is upstairs, I think Tim said. Yes. yes.
there, Tim. Mr. Chairman. Yep. Can you hear us, Tim? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the applicant can go ahead and speak. I need to come forward. That way they can hear you. Yeah. Okay. You can stand or. Okay. I see. Um, I, I really don't know what I'm supposed to say, so I guess I would be willing to answer questions. I mean, we're. My my wife and I, I, I mean, I've taken all of these years to try and convince my wife we, that we should move up here, and uh, and now she's willing. <laughs> so the the hardest part is is if we don't do this, um, I asked somebody else. I said, "Who's going to tell her that we can't build a house?" <laughs> it sounds like you've done the hard part already. Well, yeah, it, it has taken a long time. <laughs> yeah, I fell in love with this area the minute we bought the property. And in fact, when I came and looked at it, I fell in love with it. So, so you're looking for a motion now? Yeah. Well, not yet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And that the town has reviewed it, this exact request and that the Planning Commission approved it on February 2nd. And the town board approved it on February 9th, and that is unanimous board. Yep, and I was at their last town board meeting. They're they're hundred percent behind it. Okay. So. Um, yeah. So we're to the point of making a motion, right, Jason? Yep. Kim, Kim, Su Supervisor O'Connell, you want to make the motion? You're approving it. All right. Supervisor O'Connell has made a motion to approve the rezone. Do we have a second? I got seconded, I yeah, think. Yeah. Oh, he was on mute. Okay. I didn't have my mute off. Sorry. I can read his lips. <laughs> Careful, Doug. Sharon can read your lips. So. <laughs> All right. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the uh, the rezone. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carried. The rezone is approved. I mean, I know they can. No, I've signed the paperwork. Just so their names are on it. Just putting yes. Okay. Do we have findings of fact on this? Yeah, uh, findings of facts. Um, that is the property is 40.52 acres. It does have some shoreland protection zoning on the south end. It's also got an intermittent stream that runs through the south end with some wetlands surrounding the stream. There's no floodplain on this property. 
there is an existing building that would be rezoned and that building is 60 by 108 and it was built in 2006. The town um, has approved of this rezone and future rezones and that from farmland preservation to RA5. And the purpose of the rezone is to build a non-farm residence. Okay. And then the conclusions of law and that is their uh, property is surrounded by land that's already zoned RA5. So it's not going to be spot zoned. Um, and that an RA5 zoning classification and that does align with the county's comprehensive plan. And the town has approved the rezone. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Good. So let's can we get can we get Ben back in just to finish that? I'm here. What did you need? Yeah. I'm gonna ask what is the need from Doug? Oh, what was that, Doug? Oh, I just was. I thought you you asked me to finish up, and I was waiting for Ben. I didn't know what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, we're waiting for Ben. Okay. So, what's the question? The question. Or whether or not I think the question is where are we sending it to? Is it going to PTAG or is it going yeah. to the four wheeler group? Uh, to me, that's the question. I mean, and not that PTA couldn't be involved or, 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 okay, PTA, no, I'll wait till then. Okay. Monday is, was the PTA meeting. And Dan delivered that same presentation about the different types of trails. One of the, um, the first activities we did with PTAG was to develop some core functions or bylaws. And um, one of the uh, key components in those bylaws is that PTAG exists, one of the core functions is that any recommendations come from any of the standing committees that they are there. You know, again, the representation of all the different user groups, they're there to provide help and assistance if that's new proposals, new initiatives, new concepts. So um, so there's that formality there that they need a recommendation. So I think that's just some background information. From a PTAG perspective, when we look at the definitions, we, we're looking, you know, we're talking about state-owned trails and county-owned trails, but PTAG is looking broader than that. Aren't they looking at city-owned trails, village-owned trails, too? Right, they're doing that right now. So it's so at some point we need definitions around. Understand those trails too. Our PK needs to, you know, because it's not from that comprehensive perspective. Those trails are going to be looked at too, aren't they? They are, and but then they're in place. They need to be a resource for you all. You yeah. know, in the event there is a concept or initiative or new idea. Whether it's this committee or the ATDUT council, um, you know, that's what we're inviting you to do is look at them as a resource. Because as, you know, Ben explained, you know, if we wanted to create some new trails, there's funding opportunities for some, some not so much. The, the idea or the concept of a hybrid trail where you're piecing those trails together, or it makes it a destination rather than just some dead ends that yeah. aren't very attractive, you yeah. know. So there's there's some complexity to that, and also the funding for that. Just inviting you to consider them as a resource, and they're a resource for any standing or special committee like the ATDT Council. Can we make them bigger again, Kim? Sure. Oops, sorry. I, I want to jump the boathouse. There we go. Um, 
I guess my feeling is at this point is, is I would like to see it stay with the APV UTV committee, um, just because that's kind of where it started. That's kind of their thing. I'm, I'm not saying that it should never end up at PTAG, um, but I think at, at this stage, at early stage of the game yet, that committee is going to be able to move faster on things only because that's what they do. I mean, that's, that's all they're looking at. And, and like I say, it isn't saying that, that PTAG should never look at it. It just, I think for, for now, that committee is gonna be able to move faster and, and get things done in a, maybe a faster way um, to, to start the process of, at least here's where it goes, here's where our funding options are. Some of those things and maybe do some more groundwork, more legwork before it goes to PTAG. So when it comes back here or goes to PTAG or wherever it is, there's there's more legwork has been done to I'll say to get to the to the end game. I mean, um, your your thoughts, Doug? Uh, yeah, I would like to agree with what Brad is saying because that was the original intent of our chairman, Jay Luke, that we could take on some of these issues and move them along and gain ground in, that's why he intended to start this committee as just an ATV UTP committee because we can work in one direction. I, I think that's all I really have right now. Okay. Yeah. No. And and I agree with that. I mean, I think, and like I say, it isn't. It isn't. I don't believe we're telling PTAG that you're never going to see it. It it's just getting that committee that's focused on one thing to keep moving there, and then down the road, whenever that is, it could go to PTAG and be closer to a finished product. I believe. Would, would it make sense though? I I think of PTAG as being this group that's committed created by the board to provide a comprehensive overview of all trails. And it, it's very difficult for them to do their job looking at the big picture to all of a sudden at the very end, say, here's the trail the ATV group has come up with. Understanding the trail. I think the key is, is can they work, they can focus on their specialized area, but we gotta have that communication level all oh, yeah. along in the process. Yeah, and, and I so think maybe, both ways. maybe maybe that's where where Doug Johnson comes in more to maybe keep PTAG informed of here's where the ATV group is, here's almost like a standing agenda item. What's the latest from the ATV UTV group? Yeah, so I mean it wouldn't they wouldn't be blindsided by it down the road and say, well, here it is. They would always know what was going on, and yet it would the work would be being done in the UTV committee, but they would know, they would be informed all the time as to, as things happen. Well, when the comprehensive plan is developed, UTV, ATV is gonna be, it will be included. Yes, it that's all included. So it can't, it, it all has to align. It does. And it's, it's just, what's the, what's the right communication piece? Yeah. Because you can't have the ATV group. I don't want them competing. Yeah, the they can't go over here saying, here's our plan and the comprehensive plan says something totally different. It's right. got to somehow mesh. So there is an inherent potential for conflict. Yeah. And so if we're going to have PTAG supposed to be comprehensive, then we create this other side group to be very specific you see the potential for conflict there, or not conflict, but competing of resources, yeah. land, whatever it is. So ideally is, if they're gonna specialize in that, great, but they there should be constant They feed into PTA. Input and yeah, that. And no, I, yeah. They're I, almost I, like I a agree. subset of PTA. You know, you've got PTA, the overall, yeah, they're almost like, almost like a subset of PTA. We're going to focus on ATV, UTV. At some point, we might end up with a group that focuses on cross country skiers. I don't know. You know, we out of that group as they start to do, do this trail development. I, I'm just 
Yeah. No. <laughs> no, we're thinking all of them. I like cross country skiing. Because, because but that's they, the purpose of P tag, we're to consider all those things. Yes, all those things. And they know all of a sudden, and they might we don't want to. No, but they might decide, okay, this is the year our plan says we're going to do whatever. Maybe we need to have a subset focus on that this year. And who knows you know, what it end up being, but. But this can't, ATV, UTV just can't be out there on its own. It needs to be meshed with P tag, I think. Yeah, but I, I think, I still think the work needs to be done through the ATV, UTV. But yes, I agree, it needs to match. They, yeah. they need to, both committees need to know where they're at, you know, so yeah, so they're not going in, in opposite directions. Um, having said that, they should be both going in the same direction anyway. Is a, yeah. is a county trail. Yeah. Um, so. Mr. Chairman, could I interject there, please? Yep, go ahead, Doug. I don't, uh, I feel a little uncomfortable speaking for my chairman, but this was Jay Luke's idea. And the intent was not to be an independent group looking at ATV UTVs. So I, this is nothing against the PTAG group at all. It's just a matter of we are specializing in one area and trying to move forward with that, where PTAG is specializing on all trails and issues, hiking, biking, skiing, everything that there is. So his intention was to create this group so we wouldn't get bogged down in other issues when we're only dealing with one. And we have said, and I've talked to Amy and said, we'll keep you updated on what we're working on. And now we have Doug Johnson that coordinates because he's on both committees, but we're still trying to move forward with our committee's ideas. That, did I explain that correctly? Yep, I, I got it. Yeah. yeah. So would, would you be, okay, I mean, does, would your committee, you think Doug be okay with we send it back to your committee, but then Doug Johnson kind of becomes the, the liaison between the two committees to keep PTAG informed of, of where you guys are at so that they're kept up to date all the time? Uh, yes, that's been the understanding all along, is that he would, because he's on both, then it's easier for him to go to that meeting and give an update of what we're working on. But we're not, we're, it was intended that we were more independent from the start. Yep. What are your thoughts on that, Ben? Uh, my thoughts are I would I would encourage the committee to use the resources that we have in PTAG and the expertise of the folks that we, we brought in um, to sit on PTAG to present some of these ideas. Trail development, actual nuts and bolts, going out and knocking on doors and getting easements and, and that sort of thing. The, the ATV UTV committee is uniquely suited to do that type of work. They have the guys, the representation from the clubs, local, the local clubs. Um, but but I think PTAG is a is a really valuable resource when it comes to overall concepts and general planning. Yeah, and I'm not going to disagree with that, but I'm going to come back to I think because PTAG is so big and broad that that something like this gets dragged down in the weeds, so to speak where this is all the ATV group is, is, is going to work on realistically. Um, and I think as long as they're willing to keep PTAG informed of what they're doing on a, on a regular basis, so it'd be an every meeting basis realistically, if they had moved forward, um, you know, in, in some way. Um, I just think that the Sterling Loop that's being considered If, if it becomes a reality or not, I think we get to, to the end way faster by letting the two committees work together. Um, 
then PK can always say, hey, we think you should do this, and it can go back to the to the ATV committee. Um, I think the fact that, that they work together is is the key. I guess I could give one more update if I could, Mr. Chairman, in, in our thinking. Yep, go ahead. And that's the members of this committee we discussed with the, the chairman of the Polk County ATV UTV Council, and that was Todd Miller to make some suggestions of who we have. And we have Danny Carlson from the North, we have Melvin Smith, and these are all ATV UTV club members. We have Rick McGuigan from the South, and we have Doug Johnson from Mamrie. And they're all representing clubs and the county, and their vision is they have already, the there's five mile loop in Sterling already created. And the club maintains that. And Rick McGuigan went last summer and they were it had been let go for a while and it needed the trees that were taken down in the storm removed. They got their equipment up there, they cleared the trail and they got it back open and graded it and re ready for use. That's why their thinking works in what I think our committee thinks is that they are all members and know if we could get the 25, then they would be the people that would be in charge of maintaining it through this club in the state. We don't need to make a motion or anything, just a recommendation, right? I would recommend that we send it back to the ATV UTV group and they stay in consultation with PTAG and I don't see no reason that they can't work together uh, to hopefully make the process faster and yet PTAG would be fully in, involved and know what was going on. One last comment then, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Is every month our group is on the public safety and works committee agenda. So we'll the administrator will be there and I will put this on my talk to bring up where we're at with that group. How does that sound? Okay. Yep. So you okay with that too, Kim? Okay. All right. Thank you. A seven B. Jason, or we start up top. Yeah, we'll put we'll jump at the top. You just want me to kind of start through what I've got? Yep. Okay. So in response to having some feedback um, that on our board house text, I thought I'd just start off in that kind of explaining how the county can regulate board houses. Basically, we've got the statute and that which is 59692, and that's telling the county's ordinance and administrative code how they can basically work together and how much of it we have to follow. And the definition of a structure is listed right in the statute. You can see it includes sheds, boat houses, stairways, walkways, patios, and decks, retaining walls, even in fire pits. So that's very specific. Our ordinance mimics that. Um, this is one of the big things that changed in 2015. An ordinance enacted underneath this section may not regulate a matter more restrictively than a matter that is regulated by the Shoreland Zoning Standard. That's NR 115. So NR 115 is a set of rules like building codes. It was designed to be the minimum standard. Well, now with that provision in statute, it's the maximum standard. That links directly with this next bullet point there that where NR 115, that has a standard, we have to follow it. But if it is not regulated by NR 115, and that it does not prohibit the county from enforcing other rules. That's where like our side yard setbacks come in, for example. 
and our 115 doesn't regulate side yard setbacks. So we can take and have those wherever we want. And there's a lot of stuff in our boathouse stuff and that I'll get to that we're falling underneath that as well. So with the definition of a structure, we have all of those different types of structures. Boat house is defined as one of the structures that's exempt from the 75 foot setback. And the guidance that we've gotten from the DNR up to this point is that we have to make it reasonable that it can be used as a boat house. So we can't require a 50 foot setback. The county always had a 10 foot setback and that was determined to still be reasonable for people to actually put in a track system in order to be able to get the boat into the boat house. But as far as NR 115 goes, and that one could argue that you could put it right at the ordinary high water mark. This is another thing that changed 2015. Uh, Polk County was unique in that because we allowed this prior to 2015. The county always said that our max height is 11 feet. And if you wanted to have a flat roof on your boathouse, you could have a deck on the top. The statute confirmed that. And that's saying that if you have a flat roof, you can use it as a deck and the county cannot stop you from using it. Flat can still have a pitch. You know that it's a flat roof that can still pitch away from the way. And this is just our general uh, point in a shoreland zoning situation or an enforcement issue that's underneath shoreland zoning. Our time period for enforcement is 10 years. And that, so if they can prove that they've um, had that use or that building in that for over 10 years, then that we can no longer pursue enforcement on. So the same thing that we always are looking at old aerial photos and that it's kind of nice that the county flies every five years. So we usually have a photo and that that's exactly 10 years back, you know, in that preparing flights, so. Jumping into NR-115, so this is the shoreland uh, zoning policy in that that was mentioned in the statute. Boat house is defined as a permanent structure used for the storage, watercraft, and associated materials, and includes all structures which are totally enclosed, have gross walls, or any combination of these parts. Boat houses and that located above the ordinary high water mark and entirely within the access and viewing corridor do not contain plumbing and are not used for human habitation. Big thing there, and that is within the access and viewing corridor and that they cannot have plumbing. So access and viewing corridor is on a hundred foot wide lot. Any property owner is allowed to establish 35% or 35 feet in every hundred feet of viewing corridor. Um, and that clear cut right down to the water. The areas outside of that, would be considered outside your viewing corridor and that would have to remain natural unless it's an old lot that you know has been cut you know slowly over time uh, with dead trees dying and stuff but that, that boat house would have to be within that 35 percent window yeah boat houses cannot be placed inside the ordinary high water mark or in the water anymore like there there is a few of them in Polk County that actually extend over the water on over that, but that is no longer allowed. So, an ordinance in that may not prohibit the continuation of a lawful use or building. Because a boat house is exempt from the 75 foot setback, boat houses are not considered non conforming structures. They're considered conforming because they don't have any setback to. But when we look at our current ordinance, we have one block of text that is pertaining only to boat houses. Uh, the text in green here is the stuff that the county can change or that is not really limited by um, the statute or the administrative code. The dimensions, those have been consistent in that with the county for at least 20 years, going back to at least 99. Yeah. One thing that was changed in that as part of the comprehensive rewrite in 2016 was the maximum sidewall height of 14 feet because NR 115 saying that the county cannot be more restrictive. NR 115 says that a building can be 35 feet tall within the 75 foot setback. 
We've had to take and switch it from regulating an overall height to a sidewall height because NR 115 doesn't regulate a sidewall height, but they regulate the overall height. So that kind of goes back to that provision is if they don't regulate it, then we can. There's some counties in that that regulate, you know, where the doors can be placed and how big the doors can be, and how many windows they can be, uh, how many, um, you know, structures they can have on the lot like we have, the color of the board holes, you know, so I think, uh, Burnett County has about 20 to 25 different provisions for theirs, or we're at about nine. So, number um, two, that's just Department of Safety and Professional Services basically says that if you got a railing going around the top, it has to be closed. The roof must pitch away from the lake. Uh, that's been in there forever as well. Basically, it has to slope to the back or off to the side. So, if we have a normal pitch roof like this, and that going off to the side would be allowed. But if we turned our roof line like this, so that the side of the roof was coming down to the water, that would not. So a lot of times in that, if they do this, people usually put gutters on the sides and direct them back. Number four is on site solely for both storage and storage of related marine equipment, not used by humans as a place of settled residence or habitat. And that that's kind of the, the last portion here goes back to that human habitation part, the administrative code. Do not extend below the ordinary high water mark. That's in that administrative code. That was the last bullet point. Structures do not contain any plumbing, and also in NR 115. The 10 feet landward, that's where the county, you know, has maybe pushed the limits in that a little bit to try to get them back to 10 feet. Um, but the DNR has approved of that because it's still reasonable in that four four those to be able to be used. And then the number eight there must be within an access and viewing corridor. That's part of the staff. Okay. Anyone want to jump ahead to the staff recommendations? Come back. Yeah. Before you jump ahead, I just wanted to go back to number four. Well, um, because I know it's it's an interpretation of the language in the code, but the word solely is found nowhere. Um, and also the definition of human habitation isn't found anywhere in the statute or code. And so the use of the term settled residence or habitat uh, so, so those are the things that if you look at the, you know, 115031H, 115051B1M, and uh, 115051B3, and Wisconsin Statute 30.011D, those are where we find all of the various definitions of boathouses. And so trying to combine those together. So I, I think that number four should be at least partially in green is all I think. So going on from what Melina said, and then I've got that number four provision struck out, and I basically copied word for word in that out of NR 115, the definition of a boathouse in here. You can see that that does remove the word solely, and it leaves it uh, as NR 115 has. Then you'd have to refer to the statute that says that they cannot be Um, and then everything else there um, looked as is. So that would just mimic NR-115, correct? That's open up to you guys. Um, you want to change that? I don't know if it changes anything, but would we be better off to, um, I will say, just replace our, our lettering in black here, you know, that, that follows NR-115? Would we be better off to just adopt NR? Um, and I'm, I mean, on, on top of that, I'm, I'm fine with leaving all of our green lettered stuff in there. 
um, would that not take any, we would then just be following state guidelines. Uh, so, do you leave the green lettering in there and then want the provisions of, um, well, basically those four bullet points as provisions? That from that the four bullet points that I've got underneath in our 115 uh, put in with the green ones. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is I would I would consider removing all of the black lettering. Okay. You know, so like what are they two, four, five, six, and eight, and then just replacing them with the administrative code. From NR 115. From NR 115. Make it more restrictive. That makes it more restrictive. Ours is more restrictive than the state, right? Well, and that I mean, like, it's basically the same. Um, and it'd be in my opinion, that it's easier for the lay person to read it like it is. Um, and that, but if we look at, you know, that bullet point number two in our under NR 115 must be located entirely with the access and viewing corridor. That's provision eight. Do not contain any plumbing, and that is provision six. Shall not extend below the ordinary high water mark, and that that's the bullet point number three. And then number four, we're trying to match the definition in bullet point number one with the proposed X. So then that brings us down to only you know, the open handrails meeting code, I guess, so. You're saying this is, we've covered them all and it's easier to read no. the way we have. In my opinion. Yeah. But, but we're talking number four, taking solely out and taking the reference out to settled, re, of settled residents or habitat. Correct. And, that, and replacing that with the text out of bullet point number one, uh, 115. Okay. And the railing for number two, that's in 59692, uh, the provision number five or the bullet point number five. If the railing is not inconsistent with the standards uh, by the Department of Safety and Professional Services. So that's why we reference that in there. So. Yeah, and I'm, yeah, as long as four was the sticking point. Yeah. Because that one's hard because when it so it would say now designed for bolt storage and storage of related marine equipment, period. I can't see what that says up there. So, uh, so get on your okay. Yeah. okay. Means boat hoses used for the storage of watercraft and associated materials and includes all structures which are totally enclosed, have roofs or walls or any combination. So you replaced four with the first bullet point on administrative code one. Right. Right. Starting at use. Okay. Yeah. Right behind a permanent structure. Starting yeah. there and going to the end. Yeah. We okay with that? I think so. <clears throat> you make them bigger again for just a minute. Yeah. Any any thoughts on that, Doug? Or I, I I guess I was looking at associated materials. Is that what it said? Yeah. Well, all I'm doing is giving my personal experience of my wife and I associated materials by the time we lived here another 10 years would be all kinds of uses of shovels and rakes and pickaxes and everything we use down at the lake it's still a boathouse 
So I'm just letting you know that I think Associated Materials has a wide band of, of what could be in that shed. Yeah. We got the thumbs up from you, Mr. O'Connell. Yep. So we're in agreement. It's just who determines what Associated Materials is? It's my own. <laughs> if you take away if you take away the word solely, yeah, as long as it has those elements, then you're okay. Right. Um, I think the bigger question is what is the definition of habitation, human habitation, and and that's where I think the, the gray area really is there. Yeah. First time anytime you make things more gray, it's tougher for us to oh, yeah. understand. Yeah. It is exactly what NR 115 has. So, yep, we'll have to cross that bridge when we get there. On to bunk houses. What'd you say? On to bunk houses. Oh. Well, bunk houses are, are fairly new to Polk County. Um, we've never had language in our ordinances to permit a legal bunk house and that until the comprehensive rewrite and that which happened in 2016 or that was the effective date of it. Um, before that, bunk houses were always prohibited. Um, I would tell you that we got a lot of them around the lakes. You don't have to drive very far down these roads and you can see air conditioning units and that in the loft. You can take and see that they've got, uh, you know, beds in there. They've got curtains, you know, you name it. So, um, since 2016, I think that I probably only permitted three bunk houses, legal bunk houses, um, when we talked to people on that. But yet, we probably permitted, you know, a thousand sheds with bonus rooms. Well, um, just throwing out some numbers. I mean, it's common in that to do that. And when we tell people in that what the requirements are in that four bunk houses, the main thing that that you know, limits them um, is one is the square footage and that, and two is the sewer system and having to upgrade their sewer system for their house likely in order to accommodate the extra bedroom or bedrooms in the bunk house. And so when they hear that, then that tax on another 15 grand in order to call it, you know, an actual bunk house. So that's where we get the bonus rooms, you know, and that coming through on the permits. So our bonus rooms then are permitted to have a bathroom and all that too? Correct. An accessory building and that right now, it doesn't even have to have a bonus room and that. Let's say that I have a shop and that I can have a bathroom in the shop. Um, we can have laundry, you know, out there. We can have, um, you know, in that, a normal garage and that we allow, you know, for like a range to be out there because some people don't want a can in their house, you know, so they want a can out in the garage if they're a big canner. Um, and that so they can have fridges out there, that kind of stuff. Um, our current language in that for a bunk house says that you can't have any cooking facilities because I believe that one of the things that they wanted is to make sure that this doesn't turn into a second dwelling on the property. And, uh, but, Really, and that all these bunk houses are bunkies, and that they're only regulated by the Uniform Dwelling Code. Beyond that, there's no statutory language that really guides the county or says this is what it has to have or not have. Uh, it's really up to you guys. Uh, when we look at a lot, though, the county adopted density based zoning as part of the comprehensive rewrite, too, and we were trying to get you know, X number of dwellings per 40 acres. So if we look at the rezone that we just did today, residential ag five, the density goal is eight, eight houses per 40 acres. You take the total lot size, whatever it is, if it's 20, if it's 22, you divide it by five, and then you round accordingly. And that tells you how many dwelling units you can have and how many lots you can create out of that parcel. So when we're going around these lakes, you know, and that, some of these bunk houses, if they get to be dwellings, that we could actually be exceeding our density standards because we're going to have to clarify at what point, now that we've got general zoning districts within our shoreland areas ever since May of 2020, somebody's got a, a small lake 
and that and their zone RA5, you know, is a bunk you going to be classified as a dwelling, or at what point do you classify it as another second dwelling on the parcel? Um, our AG 10 and our AG 20 zoning classifications do allow for a second farm dwelling on the property. A lot of times it's for the help in that, that it's helping on the farm. That's typically where we see it. Um, and that without having to subdivide either. So that's one other case in that where the county currently allows two dwellings on a parcel. Um, but right now we don't do many bunk house permits because in that of the sewer requirements and of the size or the square footage limitations. Um, the most other common question that we receive and that is what do you count for the 400 square foot size limitation? Do you count my stairwell? Is my bathroom? Are you only counting my bedrooms? You know, what about if I've got a nice area that's finished off in sheetrock, but it's just cold storage, you know? And basically our response to that in the past here has been finished or conditioned living space. Because when it comes to uniform dwelling code, that's pretty much how they go about it too, is the conditioned part of the home. And a lot of these bonus rooms or bunk houses are going up in like a room and attic truss. And typically the conditioned living space is the actual room and attic portion of the truss. The little wings going out to the side and that, that's typically unconditioned space. That's where your insulation is. It usually that's blown with insulation. So you're not heating that portion. So that's kind of where we've drawn the line so far, but there's not a lot of clarity in that right now. So I've got some text. I included Burnett County's bunkhouse language uh, just because it's very similar to Polk County's and it had some ideas, uh, particularly in how they calculate the square footage. So. If you want to jump right into that, or if you got any questions, yeah. I'm trying to just envision the differences between bunkhouse and, like, if I've got an attached garage and I decide I'm going to go up and finish above that 30 by 36 area up there and finish it off, put a bathroom up there, is that considered a bunkhouse or? No, it is not because. And that what you said was attached garage yeah. so that's attached to the house that's part of the dwelling unit and that so somebody can finish off that bonus room area or that room and attic truss above their whole garage and that and that's part of the dwelling does not count as a bunk house but a that, bunk house it has to be a detached structure detached from the dwelling so right now and that when we have people that want to get around the 400 square foot limitation they end up doing a breezeway or a common wall or a deck or something in that structurally to connect the two buildings together so that's part of their main dwelling. So they then they can go bigger than four. Go bigger, you know. And then does that like if if you added a bathroom and a bedroom, then you'd have to change your sewer system, maybe potentially or not? Be a bunk house and that, yep. And that be look at our sewer systems that nobody likes to spend money on a sewer and that's kind of the battle that Steve fights with getting people to pay for surveys nobody wants to do that either um so when it comes to the sewer I got a three-bedroom cabin and people usually are on the low end of that anyway because they finish that you know basement off or whatever you know and um so and three bedrooms are our most common systems you know out there so even if they had a you know a three-bedroom sewer they can only have three bedrooms total on the property, but that system can really only handle six people day in and day out. And so if I got one bedroom in the bunkhouse, that means that my cabin's only two. If I've already got three in the cabin, then my bunkhouse and that would be four, and that and my sewer is gonna be undersized. So that's why the thought process was in that to take and have to upgrade the sewer system. But our current language says and that that you cannot have a separate sanitary system for a bunkhouse and, they, and that you cannot use a holding tank to just serve the bunkhouse alone. And the issue is, is that a lot of our lots in Polk County here were developed back in the 20s and the 30s and that and they're substandard lots to what's allowed today. And that even our one acre minimum lot size today can be marginal if they don't have a lot of good soils for these sites because somebody goes in there to build a house and that and they end up filling an area 
well, no, that's a system and fill, and that area is not suitable in that for a drain field unless you take and get special approval and that through an individual site design with the state. So you look at all that area, that area is gone. And that if it's on the lake, everything within 50 feet of the lake is not usable for a sewer because that's our minimum setback. Then we have our side property lines and that we've got to be at least 10 feet away from any buildings with a drain field. And, but one of the biggest thing is, is if we got a hundred foot wide lot, it depends on where the neighbor's wells are on the adjacent lots because that drain field has to be 50 feet away from anybody's well. And so that's, you know, so I mean, if he puts his well right close to your property line and the other neighbor puts it right close to your property line, you know, and that, that means that you got to move 50 feet, you know, forward or back on your lot just to get away from their wells. And then it depends on where your well is, you know, so it can be very difficult what I'm saying, and that is to put in a very large system on these small lots. But if I if I built that extra area above my attached garage and put in another bathroom, would that require me to update my septic too? Well, and that so if it's attached to the dwelling, then it's different because we're not falling underneath our bunk house provisions. We can issue what's called a loads and flows affidavit which basically comes out and says and that that I realize I got a three bedroom sewer, but you know, I've got, you know, two kids and we each want our own bedroom. So there's four of us. So we want a four bedroom place. And then what we do is we record that on the deed. And it basically says, you know, I got a drain field of X size, tank of X size and that, and I'm going to put a bigger house on it, but I'm not going to exceed the six people and that that are suitable for my sewer system because I'm only going to have four on it. Then when they come to sell it, then that comes back as part of the title research and that's so that the new buyer knows, okay, yeah, I'm buying a four bedroom house, but it's only got a three bedroom sewer, which is only suitable for six. So then they can, so, so that's kind of the process to notify them. But if she puts a bedroom in above her garage then and turns it to a four bedroom at that point and as a three bedroom sewer, does she then have to expand her sewer? No, she does the loads and flows affidavit and that so which will allow it because she still only got four people there. They just want more privacy and have their own bedrooms, you know. So now whereas a bunk house and that in our provision, we say that you cannot do a loads and flows affidavit. Um and that because typically they are they're they're well above their occupancy level when they're using a bunk house, typically. It's the weekends, it's when you got all your family and stuff up, you know, whereas there's a lot of people out there that might have a two bedroom house and want to bump it to that third bedroom. So the kid has, you know, each kid has their own and the parents yeah. have one, you know, they're still only going to have four. They're not going to be abusing it. So, but that loads and flows affidavit too, when it's done or when that sewer system fails, then they are required to put in the cold compliance sewer system for the proper number of bedrooms that they claim. So, and like I said, a lot of these lake lots were developed in that in the 20s and 30s, and their sewers are failing. So they've got an area on their lot that's already had an old drain field that they can no longer use. So it needs to be tougher and tougher that way. Bob, you want to make Doug and Kim bigger again on the screen if you can. So. Wow. It's a, it's Mr. A lot. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Doug. Well, I was just, I've been doing a lot of thinking when we heard about this coming up. And a little background is that you and I and Chris were on the citizens advisory group when this was discussed. And part of the reason that we switched from no bunk houses to bunk houses in Polk County was because they were everywhere. And we decided, well, if there is bunk houses consisting at that time, why not regulate them? And my, I, I'm asking for your memory, bad because you were there with me, but the 400 feet is sort of a, just a, a random pick on square footage because Gary Spinell, or I should say the old administrator, he was basically against bunk houses. Remember that? And yeah, no, I... I... I agree with everything you've said to this point, Doug. Okay, so I, I'm just saying, if we were to increase the square footage, it would just be because it was a random number that we came up with at the time. 
And so, uh, you know, I just wanted everybody to have some background that you and I worked on this. We were on there three years, and part of that's where this came out of. Yeah, it was a, it was a number picked purely out of thin air in the, in the scheme of things. So the only thing in that that it correlates to at all is that the minimum dwelling size in Polk County is 400 square feet. Yep. That's the only thing that I know of in that that could even be possible to do. Yeah, because, yeah, that's the minimum size structure is 400 square feet. So I'll just throw my thoughts out there. I think the, the, the 400 square feet needs to disappear. I would say 1,200 square feet, maybe that's maybe that's too big. Um, but it needs to be something considerably different than 400 square feet. Um, and I say 1,200 square feet because only because it's a nice, simple map. It's a 30 by 40 garage. Uh, and then I think on four, five, and six, I don't know, I'll say we kind of need to com combine them maybe, but on, on five and six anyway, on five, I would say that going from holding tanks are not allowed. Um, I, would, I would allow holding tanks. And then on six, I would allow a separate, <clears throat> instead of a prohib prohibiting uh, bunkhouses to have their own sanitary system, I would allow them be that a sanitary system or a holding tank for that bunkhouse. Um, and yeah, and so that kind of, I think, draws four into it too somewhat, but. Um, four that, is different in that because four is basically only saying that you have to have adequate sanitary for the total number of bedrooms on the lot. Okay. And, that, and, and that we can't use that loads and flows affidavit. Yep. So that's going to trigger them um, to take and put in that, that holding tank to serve the bunk calls. You yep. know? And yep. So then I'll, I would, I would okay. skip four, leave it the way it is. But to me, I would, um, I would just say that holding tanks are allowed. And then I would, I would allow a separate sanitary system um, for, a, for a bunk house. Um, What's the I, reason? You only have three permits in all these years because everybody is going the other way because they can get the bigger and they don't have to deal with okay i mean we as as jason said at the start i think we have them all over anyway yeah. it's just <clears throat> we might as well encourage them to come in and get the right permit the issue in that is is that if, if the county makes it easier to get a permit to do it the right way, then they're going to fall under the uniform going code. So then the electrical is going to be inspected, the plumbing is going to be inspected. Um, that's kind of the concern because in that you don't have, you know, somebody like myself or a backyard Joel building the structure then and that without any inspection. So it's still going to be okay if they build it, but they're going to have the inspections and that comes with it. So, yep. Um, I do have two other suggestions. I'm not trying to create policy with any of this and that, but it's just kind of feedback, bringing it back to the committee. Um, number nine, since the ordinance has been uh, reworked, the accessory building height limit changed from 25 feet to 35 feet. So right now, if they're building a shed, they can build it to 35 feet with that bonus room. But if, I, but if they build a bunk house and that, they can only go 25 feet. And so if you pick your 30 by 40 building in that, by the time you put a 10, 12 pitch on it, um, and that it could easily get up to over 25 feet and that in height. So we should look at, we should look at making that maybe the, just go to the 35 feet that would be consistent. Consistent with accessory buildings. With everything else. Yeah, you know, because in our ordinance here too, we say that one cost has to take to the accessory building setbacks. So we're treating them as accessory still, but you got to have the UDC inspections and you got to have a good sewer for everything. So, and then uh, provision 18, I think that that one, um, that is not needed. And then the reason being must meet the minimum lot size requirements at the time of lot creation. Well, if it's a buildable lot and that for a dwelling and that it's going to be meeting that requirement. And if we back up and that's at number 14, it cannot be the first building on the lot. So we got to have a dwelling. And if it doesn't meet the minimum lot size requirements, then it doesn't meet provision 13, which is an out lot. An out lot is simply a lot that doesn't meet the, the size limitations when the lot is created. 
So 18 is like, it's just extra. So. And when it says number 12 cooking facilities are prohibited, does that just mean you can't have a stove, but you can have a refrigerator, you can have sink and Typically, and then we'll allow you to have like a yeah. okay. And then just uh, backing up the provision one, basically copy and paste of this text right from one of the ponies. It says square footage is measured as all area within the exterior walls of the habitable area. Both porches will be included in these amounts, but decks will not be included in these amounts. Although not habitable by definition, bathrooms, utility rooms, kitchens, entryways, closets, and interiors. Are we okay with that? And that that any other storage area that would be above that square footage must be separated by a wall and a door. Can you see it, Sharon? Otherwise, I got it printed out here in my copy. You sent that to us? I did not. Okay. I don't know. I was just saying how good my eyesight is, but I cannot see that. Thank you. Just be nice for us to have some clarity and uh, what you want counted or not. So we actually got a compliance issue you going to make them bigger again. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm, just, I'm just looking at that paragraph and I know you mentioned 1200 square feet and we're back to just, and this isn't anything to do with your suggestion that to say we're back to random 1200 sounds awful large to me. Our house is only 1,060 square feet. Uh, so I can look around and you're getting a pretty big building. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. And there again, it's like the 400 square feet. I fully admit it's a number. I picked it because of a 30 by 40 garage. That's the only reason I said 1,200 square feet. I mean, I I don't care what it is. Um, but that that's how I came up with 1200 square feet. I, I agree. I, th I think it's, I think it's big myself. Um, but that was my rationale for 1200 square feet. Yeah. So I don't have an answer. I just wanted to throw that out there. That that just sounds yeah. a little large, but. Supervisor O'Connell, 1200 square feet too big. Oh, 400 is way too small. <laughs> we always said that before. Yeah, yeah, so we're living on the edge, you're saying, Kim? Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, now we're not in public hearing and that, but I have had three form letters come in um, that over the last week since that they've known that it's going to be talked about. And all three of these letters, like I said, they're a form letter, say a thousand square feet, is what they're asking yep. for. Yeah, and, and there again, I'm, like I say, my rationale at 1200 was 30 by 40. Um, and it just is, it, it needs it needs to be bigger than 400, you know. Um, so I will say that Washburn County, and that is 400 square feet as well. And you have the Burnett County one that's 499. There's those two. Would you would you be better? You think a thousand is better, Doug? Uh, I'd say eight hundred to a thousand. I narrowed it right down, didn't I? <laughs> I Kim, how, how's how's a thousand for you? Nine hundred. You're you're okay with a thousand? Okay. You okay with a thousand, Doug? Ah, uh, sure. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Yeah, it's better than four hundred. Yeah. Okay. And one other, one other. So, in other words, you're okay with this text then? 
one to two thousand volts back. We'll get rid of five and six. Change or twenty-five to thirty-five. Well, we're not, we're not necessarily, well, I don't know. I mean, if we get a, are we getting rid of six? I mean, I thought we were just going to allow a separate sanitary system. Yep. If we get rid of it, then we'll allow it. Oh, by getting rid of it, it's, yeah. it's allowable. Okay. All right. Okay. And then uh, 18, well, sorry, 25 to 35 feet, then 18 would go away. Yep. Yeah. Then. Mr. Chairman, on number nine, yep. the reason, the, reason uh, the, the rationale on 25 to 35 is one, it's the same as what the original structure is, but I'm, I, I was told by con a contractor that this may, it's, it's easier to build a bunkhouse with 35 feet than it is with 25 feet to try and design it in around the square footage of a upstairs. So. I, I am in favor of 35. I don't know if we're talking about changing it, but that was the original why we brought it back to committee and discussed it. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. And we did switch it to 35 feet. Yes. Um, Where you run into it is a lot of times you know, these are bonus rooms above a garage. So they want a 10 foot sidewall, you know, in that for their garage area so that they can get at least an eight foot overhead door in. You know, and, that, and then, you know, if you've got a 10, 12 and you're 30 wide and that that's almost 14 feet of truss on yeah. top of that, so there you're at 24, 25 feet. So you're right there. Yep. So one other thought, and maybe it's, it's kind of tied to bunkhouses, maybe not. <clears throat> um, I, I, I think I would be in favor of requiring shoreline mitigation of a certain percentage. If the shoreline had no mitigation, so those those places, Jason, where you said they're you know they've they've mowed right to the shore, so to speak. I think if they come in for that accessory structure building, not necessarily, I guess you know it's tied to a boathouse, but it, but it isn't. If I have no mitigation and I want that accessory structure, I think we should require a, you know I, I'm going to say 10% mitigation, but there again, that's like 1,200 square feet. It's just a number. Unfortunately, um, that this text here is not proposed text to that, but no, Tony Shoreland zoning ordinance may not require a person to do any of the following and it's establish a vegetative buffer zone on previously developed land. So those lots that are clear cut and, and mold grass or expanding an existing vegetative buffer zone. So it would be unlawful for us to take and say that, oh, you want a bunk house, you got to have at least 10% buffer on your property. And that we could not do that. Even if you say an accessory structure, we could. Yeah. And that, and the one thing that we do have in that to fall back on is that you're allowed 15% impervious surface on the property. So anything above that 15% impervious, you would have to take and mitigate. We could add a provision in there, I guess, and that that would say that they would have to do it in native plantings. If you wanted to have more native plantings, but sometimes that gets to be four to five thousand square feet of native plantings. So I mean they're planting a lot. So well, my only thought was to get those lots that have nothing, you know, to make them have, I will say, something. You know, if you if already you had 40, 50 percent, well then just build. But I, I was looking at trying to get those that are moving right to the shoreline and saying, okay, we want. You know, give us a little bit for, but if we can't, we can't. I mean, like I said, we could maybe require them to do a percentage or do all the native plantings, but we're not going to be able to require it in the buffer zone. So it's just going to be someplace on the property. So if they get over 15%, they're going to have to, do, have to something. do something anyway to capture the so, runoff. Okay. okay. Yep. More than likely, they probably will with a bunk hose, you know, that's going to be of that size. So we're okay with it as the changes. So we'd like to include this then as our amendment with our fence stuff. Remember, we, we've got that hanging back there. We haven't made any changes from that last meeting that we talked about that. Yep. And we'll package this all together as one uh, one ordinance and then for you to take and act on as a county board. 
Um, so it'll, we'll, but we'll need a public hearing on this, right? Need a public hearing in that. So, so with three weeks off here in between before our next meeting, do we have time to? Now we do not have time to get on the uh, April 7th meeting and that, but we could get it on and that's the uh, following meeting and that the 21st. Yeah. April 21st could be before the county board in May. Well, you know, I did find a fence built out of bicycles. Yeah, yeah. Got a dresser. There's some pretty weird stuff out there, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we create all these rules for the 5%, not the 95%. Yeah. Forgiveness. Works. Sounds good. So we'll, I'll plan on that hearing then on the 21st. So good. Okay. Yep. You're up. Tim. I'll be Bob for two minutes. All right. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Um, so uh, the topic here before you is the Comprehensive Trail Network Plan RFP. As you guys know. Got an update last meeting from Bob that Polk County uh, Parks and Trails Advisory Group has been working on this project amongst a few others that were more uh, administrative in nature. And they developed um, a recommendation that we pursue the RFP. Staff has developed that RFP. We worked with them, sent this out to them about a week and a half, two weeks ago, met with the PTAG group uh, on Monday night. Went over some revisions, uh, some ideas that they had about how to make the RFP better. And then I believe that was shared with you yesterday. Does everybody have a copy of that? Um, so I thought I'd just kind of give you a brief overview of what's in the RFP. And then we can, at the end, what we're going to look for is a recommendation from you guys uh, to move this forward that uh, we can go ahead and release the RFP to get the project rolling. So what's in the RFP? Um, basically, start out with a project overview. So we give some background information on uh, what the county is composed of, our population, key uh, features of it, really brief stuff. And then we move into project narrative and kind of the overall goal of this RFP is that we're looking uh, for qualified professional consultants to develop this comprehensive trail network plan. Uh, that identifies new trails, trail connections, and ancillary facilities uh, for each user group that we have in uh, the authorizing resolution for PTEC. So that would be ATVs, UTVs, snowmobiling, biking, hiking, walking, uh, cross country skiing. Um, and we want to make sure that these uh, trails and the network is a safe, functional, convenient, and attractive. System. So after we describe kind of just in paragraph form what the project is about, we look into scope of services. So this is what we're asking the consultants to do. Um, and what we're going to ask them to propose how they're going to accomplish this. So the first part is conducting public engagement. And the engagement we're looking for definitely needs to have demand information about how, what's the level of demand for trails from these different user groups and the experiences or facilities that they would like to see with those with those trail with the trail development. Um, uh, identification based on that public involvement. The consultant will identify the new trails, uh, trail connections with existing trails, uh, prioritize those trail projects and also any relevant associated facilities for the trails. They'll also develop uh, an implementation plan or an implementation schedule that should include planning level cost estimates. So it's not going to be engineering where we know exactly what the trail surface, the width, the materials, all that sort of stuff. But as Ben takes to put it, closest to zero. 
for you. So you get an idea anyways as to how much one of these projects will cost. Um, some of the deliverables that we're expecting from uh, the consultant would be obviously to develop this trail network plan. We need to have an inventory of the recreational assets in there, public involvement activities in summary, and then a recommendation on the facilities in this overall trail network outline. The consultant will also be expected to present uh, their findings and the final plan to PTAG, Paramount Services, and the board. We have three meetings scheduled at a minimum that they'll have to respond to or be a part of. And then they'll have to work with us to develop a project website that will host key information like meeting dates, uh, draft plans, public engagement opportunities, those kind of things. Kind of the nuts and bolts of what we're asking them to do and what we're asking them to bring us back. Um, other information in this uh, RFP is the pro proposal submission information. So when is the proposal going to be available? When is it due back? What are the required contents of that proposal? How to submit that proposal and who to submit it to and the timeline for responses and when the project will start. And lastly, uh, we have proposal evaluation criteria. So we're going to judge this based on five different categories and we're assigning percentages to them, as you can see here. Approach methodology and work plan gets 25%. Project interest and understanding is 20%. Plan design and schedule is 20%. Overall cost and pricing structure is 20%. And then the history and past experience of the consultant is 15%. So we'd like to use a scoring sheet to evaluate these proposals by and say it's out of 100, then you could say the approach methodology and work plan would be 25 points of that. So questions or concerns about this? So we worked on this with uh, PTAG and <coughs> Came up with the RFP to describe exactly what we're requesting this company to do. Well, ultimately, we need you guys to give us the thumbs up to move ahead with this project. If you recall correctly, fifty thousand dollars has been allocated to the Polk County uh, to the Parks and Trails Advisory Group, and it was for this project. So, depending on where the RFP uh, responses come in at. We talked with consultants beforehand. It was smack dab kind of in the middle when I talked to a bunch of different consultants. They thought, based on the loose scope that I provided with them, it was a forty to sixty thousand dollar project. That could change because the scope has been defined better here, but it's it's likely that uh, it would be within the allocation of resources that's already been given. Any questions? Bigger again, Bob. Any any thoughts, questions? Um, it's a pretty aggressive schedule. The proposal doesn't get released till the nineteenth, and you want oh, it's just written questions received by the twenty sixth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're giving them. It's not. Do you mind? No, yeah, go ahead. Um, Dave suggested a pre-proposal meeting with prospective consultants is a good one. I'd like to insert that in there because um, we have we have been cold calling consultants uh, throughout this process, particularly when you know staff took on this effort to write the RFP ourselves. And so there's a lot of folks aware, vendors aware of this. So I think it'd be a good idea other than having that tight window for questions to be submitted and us to respond to also schedule a in person or virtual pre proposal meeting with potential vendors. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, no, I, I like it too. And and I think it gets the companies on board with what we're want, with what we want. And and you know, we want to make sure that those companies know what we're after so that we get what we're we're looking for. We get the result in the end that we're looking for. Right. 
and staff will be managing this project. And obviously, ETAG will be the steering committee. There'll be several meetings um, with those groups. And, and so, on the front end, again, the value of the pre consultant meeting is they have those clear expectations laid out. So, it will be better in the long run. Right. And we won't have to, you know, renegotiate or relook at our contract if. If um, our expectations or deliverables change. That's in lieu of the question and answer timeline instead of that or in addition to as part of our proposal where we're giving them seven days to ask questions and 14 days to reply to that. Is that in lieu of that? You could probably just add that. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, I. I I think it would be something added. I, I guess the reason that I propose this is you know, being a consultant and responding to a lot of these RFPs. We will have a lot of questions. And it will take a lot of staff time if I have 10 questions of him. The other consultant has 10 questions and some of them are going to be similar. But if we can get that taken care of in a um uh, a pre-proposal meeting where all of the consultants that would like to come in um can come in there and we can present questions or maybe even prepare questions for for staff to go over at that meeting so that all of the consultants are kind of on the same you know age in terms of what the county is requiring because again, having responded to the, especially planning type ones, I mean, the engineering proposals, you know, they're pretty cut and dried sometimes. But when you're looking at planning, it's, you know, how far do you go? Um, you know, trying to get it to be as much apples and apples as possible so that when you have to make that decision, you know, that, you know, you're, you've got, I can consultants. You're asking, you know, all of them for the same thing, basically. You're starting from the same <clears throat> place. It would be good. I like what you said. Still submit those questions ahead of time. So when you do have that meeting, you're able to you're able to look at those questions and prepare for the meeting. And you might get some other ones at the meeting, but but you'll yeah. have them ahead of yeah, time. Yeah, I I would think get the questions in answer the questions, then anybody who is looking to bid the job could have the answer to those questions up front. So you know them. Um, and then yeah, have that meeting afterwards. So like you say, everybody was everybody was on the same page as to what we wanted. Yeah. Um, does that then require I mean most of this would that just be a staff meeting with right. yeah. we would arrange that and you know I think some Potentially, we'll have some consultants throughout the Midwest, so they'll be attending virtually. We can we can do logistics. Good. Yeah, but I think they're in. It doesn't matter to me, but you set a date for that virtual meeting right up front when it goes out to say you've got. Yeah. We'll put it in. seven to ten days yeah. to ask questions, and then ten days after that, or whatever. Here's the date of the virtual. Right. Um, with you. Here's our timeline that Sharon brought up. Um, upon your recommendation, we would like to, you know, spend a little time um, cleaning up this final RFP and then releasing it in two days. And so what we'll do is insert in here a pre-proposal face-to-face or virtual meeting within that timeline prior to the proposal due date. We'd like to, we, the reason we chose this date and it's actually PTAG's recommendation, they would like for the proposals to be due prior to their next meeting in April. We have a bid opening time, um, which is in the East Conference Room on April 15th, which is roughly what, three weeks from now. And you know, consultants are invited to attend that as well. 
but the idea was to do the bid opening staff would vet we get 20 applications staff staff has been empowered to bring the top candidates to PTAG at their subsequent meeting that following Monday and from there they'll make a recommendation on which consultant to select I want to ask Dave a question just from the consulting side of things is for consultants everywhere is that too aggressive of a time I'll just say from from my standpoint when I look at it it looks it looks awfully aggressive and is asking an awful lot of those people who want to bid it uh, <laughs> yeah, it's always too aggressive <laughs> I don't know how aggressive when they want milk. <laughs> That's fun of black and blue my legs up. From a consultant standpoint, I mean, um, I think it's a little aggressive, um, you know, but, you know, I should clarify that in saying that if we want this, we will do it by then. Yeah. You know. um, but there's a lot of time that goes into these proposals. A lot of resources, uh, you know, um, but there again, uh, you know, I, 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 I will say that, you know, whatever timeline you establish is what you can follow. You're the boss. So when would when would you, in theory, have the meeting with those who are looking to bid the project? Well, we can work offline and figure a date. Like I, we've been we've been communicating with potential vendors. So we'll we'll find a date and time, but it would probably be uh, I don't know, after after the second. Without putting a lot of thought to it. We have it on the second, because if you're gonna respond to the question, wouldn't it make sense to have it the second or before? That way that way they have the max time to get everything they need. We'll find a good day. Second's Good Friday, too. So you may want to that next week in here. See, now we stretched, and it wasn't even me who's trying to stretch the window <laughs> out. Well, my question was going to be is if you have such a tight timeline, are we going to limit the quality of vendors that you may get to extra bidding if they don't have the time to bid it? Well, that's a good question. See, by the due date, we only have one application, one proposal, and we'll have to reevaluate it and decide the deadline. Why don't you just do it up it's front? Because that kind of looks bad it. if you do it that way. Well, I like what Dave said. If they want it bad enough, they're going to get it put together. And these are professionals that they, they do this all the time. It isn't like they don't work towards tight timelines. They all know how to work towards tight timelines. Right? You know how to work towards Yeah, we'll be working on this by April 13th. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that you know if we had that pre-proposal meeting, you know, April 2nd, that that's plenty of time to go up. It's almost two weeks early. But realistically, you're gonna have to push that to either the first or the fifth, right? You're probably not gonna want to have it on Good Friday. Right. I think by by Good Friday, we would have actually heard from most consultants their questions. And then Tim and I, well, I mean, you got well, to hear from them by the 26th. 26. Well, you could have it before that. So what if we left the time frame the same, but gave them until the, what would it be, the 29th to get their questions in that following Monday? Why do you need it more time for your questions? Just trying to give them a little more. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be considerate. <laughs> but they could always bring their question up in that, that meeting too. So they, the question, just the pre right. questions, you don't need to have them in. Right. But the more written questions we get, the, the shorter the conference becomes. Uh, and, and if there's, you know, com, some consultants that can't make that 
in proposal meeting, then at least you folks would have questions, uh, written questions. I mean, uh, you know, what we want to try to avoid is consultants calling you with questions. You know, so that um, because that's going to, you know, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because realistically, we're only giving them four days to get their questions. In. They're going to have to open it because they're going to get it on Friday. That's full, full extent. They're going, to, they're going to get Monday through Thursday of the next week to get their written questions in. So they're going to, you know, maybe that's enough. I don't know. We'll extend it. Let me ask you a question. I wasn't at the PTAG meeting, but didn't PTAG go over and set the timeline we want? Right. So and so now, I, I mean, I, I think they're trying to say we want this. I we want it to move quickly. Yeah. Well, no, I'm saying that the final the final date could be the same. I'm just looking at trying to give them an extra day or two to ask questions. Or I I'm make... fine with it. I'm fine with it anyway. I don't care. I just. I think it's very aggressive, and, and I think we're we're really taking the chance of picking some out who are going to say, yeah, we don't have the time. We'd like to do it, but we don't have this time frame to get this done in. Um, and so I'm really noted. We'll adjust those time frames. Yeah. Did you make that meeting that Dave is talking about? Do you make that a mandatory for all bidders? Okay. Well, you propose a meeting. For prospective vendors to ask and receive answers about the project. Well, the can, ones that attend are going to have apples to apples comparison, and the ones that don't are going to have apples to oranges. But right, that's so those choice. folks that come so, to that, it's advantageous to come to that meeting, yeah. though, because they'll have a better. I picture. think we're getting down in the weeds where we don't need to be again. Right. Aren't we? <laughs> I, I think we are. I think what's it? Yeah, you can you know. manage it. I drug you in the weeds. Yep, you did. You guys figure out that timeline, what you feel comfortable yeah. with. Yep. Any, uh, Doug, any, any thoughts, questions? Uh, no, I really don't have much. I, I, we just, we just received this proposal. What was it? Monday from Carol? Yesterday. And, it, yesterday, okay, I read through it, and but it just it seems like a, a compre compressed timeline. That's all I think. But I think that was on purpose. They wanted it compressed. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think compressed just <laughs> ups the odds that we get less measures. So. Go ahead, Kim. How about West Central? Are they done? They raise their price to us. Are they going to come up with something? Yep, West Central. We can. Yeah, they can be contacted, and if they want to bid on it, they certainly can. They can propose to it. No, we already pay them. Yeah, we already pay them. So can they help a little? Yeah. So what are we paying them for if we don't get help? Good day, you're back, Supervisor O'Connor. Well, they raised their price two percent. They said, "Do us, so are they going to help us?" Yeah. So, so change the timeline or something. Uh, we'll, we'll make it a little more flexible. So if we change the timeline, everything else looks good. You guys fit in. The end timeline will be on. Any other updates that you guys would like to have for RFP before give it the thumbs up? Do we need a motion to him for you to do it or you got something, Kim?
Hey, we're not we're not getting you, Kim. I'll tell you. I'll let it go. Yeah, now we, we heard you at the end there. How about the cattail trail? Do it again. Yep, lost you again. We got cattail trail, but that was that was it. Um, okay, so we need a motion to move this or, or not? It's just oh, oh, yeah, we need a motion to move this on. Or... We need a motion to authorize okay. We have a motion to. Okay. All right. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the uh, RFP. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion passed. Thank you, everyone. Agenda item 10. Yep. By the way, thank you all. Well, actually, we're on nine. We know. Moving on to the old agenda. But yeah, agenda item number nine. Thank you for that recommendation, by the way, for us to move forward with the comprehensive trail network planning effort. In regards to the environmental services division, and under here, uh, the codification project is nearly complete. Uh, Muni code is open. Um, Muni code, our vendor will be uh, providing us with a uh, codified code book, as well as a searchable online tool uh, by the end of uh, March. That's a long, historic project that uh, is nearly complete and uh, I just wanted to share that with you also Lori's successor the zoning technician or administrative assistant or as we have it coded um, that position is posted so we're looking at um, succession planning and uh, that is on the county website as well as some other job search or professional development sites. So if you know of anyone who's interested and interested in the world of land use and zoning, we'll be having a vacancy soon. Lastly, something I wanted to bring up um, back, we talked earlier about the Land Plus Water Conservation Association. We, members of that professional association, you as environmental services committee serve as what's called the LCC, or Land Conservation Council, every county has one. Um, as you know, a Governor Evers state biennial budget is being proposed. And there are several bills. Uh, one of the things, and I just thought I'd run this by you, um, one of the um, initiatives within Governor Evers budget is to provide up to $13 million for county conservation staff and support. Right now, that's actually in the state statute, statute 92.14, um, where the goal for the state is to fund an average of the first three staff positions in any counts, county conservation department at 100%, 70%, and 50%. That goal um, has not been reached for several Biennial budgets. In fact, um, our program annually statewide receives 9.4 million. So we're roughly what 
$3.6 million short with that state goal to provide dad cap with those dollars to provide again, 100% for your top earning folk person or staff person in land and water, 70% for the second, and then 50% for the third. Historically, we've been only been able to pay for 100%, 70%, and 50% just has not been met. I'm sharing all this with you because land plus water has drafted a, a resolution encouraging that that base funding goal for only conservation staffing be, be met. And so I'm guessing, I'm pretty confident this has been shared with all LCCs um, throughout the state. So I'm just curious as to what your position is in terms of supporting a resolution. Um, they have a basic template form resolution that they're encouraging counties to look at. And we can bring that resolution to you if you are interested in advocating for that increase in base funding. So I'm just trying to measure the waters here. Is this something you would advocate for? Is this something we can bring forward for your consideration? It's basically, again, a resolution, just a declaration supporting that increase in funding for county conservation. Just saying, we we support that increase that's proposed in the budget. That's, yes, that's being proposed in the budget. So the budget, after you, the budget proposal would fulfill that. Yes. So they're advocating for thirteen million historically. Well, right now it's at nine point four. So they're trying to fill that gap, additional three point six million, in the next final budget, which again is 2022 through 2023. So realistically, they're looking for 3.6 million for a total of 13 million. They're not looking for an extra 13 million. No. They're looking at just increasing past base funding allocations from 9.4 to 13 million. And that would be spread statewide. How would that would impact us here in land and water? Um, half of the third highest wage earner, and again, they all have to do conservation work and everyone does in that department. So the third highest wage earner, half of that person's salary would be subsidized with this increase. But we already have that person. They would just start right. subsidizing. Right. So, so right have, now, yeah, we have X amount of people, the top two earners are subsidized, 100% and 70%. So this would just add 50% to that third person. I'd say we support it. When are they voting on the budget, Bob? Coming up, what, September? The window is still when we need to. I mean, is this, well, we can't act on it today because it's no. not on the agenda. I'm just so, looking. Yeah. You know, Why don't yeah. you get a copy to us? Yeah. Get a copy to everybody. Um, and then we can take a look at it and see what we're voting for or against. Yeah. It sounds um, good. And it's then we'll put it on, we'll put it on next meeting's agenda. Well, we've gone through well, these, you know, these resolutions and yep. I was gonna say we will have time with the state budget when it passes. We'll have time to incorporate anything you guys decide to do with this into the county budget before November. Okay. So would it just go through this committee or would it be a resolution that would actually go through the county board? Um, I, I think ideally we should probably do it as one of those committee amendments to the budget and where the committee pushes it, you know, environmental services recommends the general government for consideration for the final budget. I would think that would be the best process with this being the sponsoring committee. That's how we do everything else. Public safety says we want this for the sheriff's office. We recommend general government incorporate this in the budget. That would be my recommendation. Okay, but we don't know that we're gonna get it because we're just asking the, 
We're just realistically asking the governor to push forward and fund the 3.6 million. We're not, you know, for statewide. Um, it's an advocacy effort, really, for the next biennium budget. So it doesn't really impact the budget. Um, right. It's really just it declaration. It would our budget unless it actually passed state budget. And then it would be savings. And then it would be, and then it would be 50 percent savings yeah. of the third yeah. person. Next year and the following. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you could know, really do, you could do it either way, I guess. Yeah. But to answer your question, I mean, we've done these before, you know, these sort of declarations encouraging the state to do certain things. Normally it comes from a standing committee and oftentimes not always, but it gets endorsed by the full county board as well. Well, send it out to us every month to decide how we need to do it. I was just seeing how, you know, how supportive of you, you were with it and whether or not you wanted to, to do this. So we'll add that to uh, our next meeting's agenda. That's April 7th. Chairman Olson, I guess that's a good segue. Unless any of you have any questions, good segue to agenda item nine. Uh, we do have a public hearing for April 7th, the Reed Zone in the town of Georgetown, uh, Ag 5 to R1. Uh, so that'll be on the agenda. If you'd like, we could look at the final, well, we can look at what's going to be published in terms of those amendments to the shoreland protection zoning ordinance that we discussed earlier today. Keep that on the agenda. It looks like we wouldn't be able to change them at no. that point, but we could see where they landed. Yeah. 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 And because we'll look at scheduling again that public hearing for um, those amendments and new conditions to boathouses and bunkhouses. Again, we'll package those with the uh, the fencing ordinance change that's also in the shoreland protection zoning ordinance. We'll package those together in the same publication. We'll do an update on um, on the proposals for P tag as well. The comprehensive trail network planning. Give you an update on that as well. And beyond that, looking at the work plan. Again, presenting the second week of April. We have the work plan in there. might be an item or two on the work plan. Forgive me, I don't have that one. We'll also have a, a a resolution ready for the next meeting regarding the zoning um, with the town of St. Croix Falls and the county. So we'll be at the next meeting. You can order that and follow up with that chair. Thank you for that. Uh, I would like to have a discussion. Me and Bob talked about this the other last Thursday after my executive meeting, but I would like to have a discussion of possibly working with the DNR, people with hiking trails that are already there on state property. Um, trails are already there. Um, just to expand hiking snowshoeing, skiing opportunities. Um, just see what the committee's interest is in it. See if the DN, you know, if, if we're interested in moving forward, is the DNR interested in working with us? Um, these trails that would need realistically no work, you know, other than a few signs. Um, 
Maybe we're interested, maybe we're not. I'd just like to have that. And they're not open today. They are. It would be a way of making them, can I say, more publicized? Oh, sure. You know, um, putting them putting them on a map, um, you know, to say here's a trail. Because, yeah, of course, you know, no different than county land. It's it's all open. It would be a matter of spending a few dollars in signs and then being able to put them on a map with the rest of the trails in the county to say, Here's, you know, what I will call a true wooded trail, you know, yep. um, and and so that's yes, they are open today. It's just a matter of making I'll say people aware of the fact that they are, you know, they're there and available because today you drive down the road, nobody knows that they're yeah. there or available. So are you talking about like waterfowl production areas and and all of that? Yeah, well. Any anything where there's where there's state land, I'll just I'll pick on myself again because that's where I look at. It. I mean, I, I live on 2,500 acres of state land that realistically have roads flowing through them that are 15 to 20 feet wide everywhere. Um, it's just that no one knows that they exist. You know, to go walk on them. Um, you know, most of those roads you could meet two vehicles on. Uh, a lot of those roads and they're they're wide now. I look at it as if you know we're looking for more recreation opportunities as the county. These opportunities exist. The trails are already there. All we need to do is, if if the state is willing, is to put signs on them and and say you know here's you know put them on a map somewhere, or somebody can pull them up on their phone and say here's a trail. And it is really very, I think, very inexpensive. I mean, um, kind of like county land, like Auburn. Yes. People don't know it's there, and so they don't use it much. But once we get more signage and stuff, right? You'll see more. Yeah, I mean, I can drive down the road, and because I know there's a two mile road there, doesn't you know? You're going to drive by and say, well, it's just a woods, yeah. you know, um, in the you know. The ability to to work with the DNR perhaps and and just get them out there and say here's where these trails are so that they show up on a map so they show up on something and say here's here's an opportunity. Well, I just think down in we don't we're not going to have a lot of opportunity in the southern part of the county for the trail. I mean, you, you have a trail that goes from Clear Lake to Clayton. You have on the old railroad bed you have the cattail from Emory to Turtle Lake. But when you talk about DNR land, there, there's more DNR land down there, but it's not, you know, it's not 2,500 acres of big roads in it, but it might be 160 acre chunk, it might be an 80 acre chunk. Um, and every so many years, they'll actually, somebody will plant it, and then they'll put it back into native native grasses. I mean, and so what you'd have to do is just run a mower through it once or twice a year, and, you know, you can make the trails that way. I, mean, I don't know how that plays into the the big plan, but you know, if you're looking at doing some of it, you might as well go for. Well, yeah, I'm. I'm saying is, is a discussion to do we want to ask the DNR? Do you want to partner with us to, you know, make these make the trails that are already there, make them known to people for possible use? Is that something that would be referred to, like PTA? I don't know because I think if the DNR was involved and they said yes, it'd be pretty easy. I mean, the, the trails are already there. You know, yeah. it isn't like we would have to go and. You're wanting this to be put on the map? Yeah. I'm yeah. just going to point and say we're getting too far. <laughs> put it on the next agenda. Put it on the next agenda. <laughs> Like the details of this <laughs> What? Yeah. Oh, I make a motion we adjourn. <laughs> what? You want to second that, Supervisor O'Connell? <laughs> right. I forgot my phone. <laughs> All in favor?
Aye. 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 We stand adjourned. <laughs>